Chapter 5 from George Ivanovich Gurdjieff's Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson. The System of Archangel Harriton. Shortly afterward, again under the supervision of the great Archangel Adosia, practical tests open to all were made with this new invention, which was later to become so famous. The new system was unanimously acknowledged to be the best and soon it was adopted for service throughout the universe, gradually superseding all previous systems. At the present time, the system of the great angel, now Archangel Harriton, is in use everywhere. The ship on which we are now flying is based on the same principles, and its construction is similar to that of all ships built according to this system. It is not very complicated. The whole of this great invention consists of a single cylinder-shaped like an ordinary barrel. The secret of this cylinder lies in the disposition of the materials of which its inner walls are composed. These materials are isolated from each other by means of amber, and owing to their arrangement in a certain order, have the property of acting on any cosmic gaseous substance entering the space they enclose, whether atmosphere, air, ether, or any other combination of homogeneous cosmic elements, causing it immediately to expand within the cylinder. The bottom of this cylinder barrel is hermetically sealed, but the lid, although it can also be tightly closed, is hinged in such a way that on pressure from within it, from within it opens and then shuts again. So, your right reverence, if this cylinder barrel is filled with atmosphere, air, or any other such substance, the action of its walls causes these substances to expand to such an extent that the interior becomes too small to hold them. Striving to find an outlet from this constricted interior, they naturally press against the lid of the cylinder barrel, which opens on its hinges, and allows these expanded substances to escape, and then immediately closes again, since, in general, nature abhors a vacuum. As soon as the expanded gaseous substances are released, the cylinder barrel is again filled up with fresh substances from outside, and they in their turn undergo the same process, and so on without end. Thus, the substances are always being changed, and the lid of the cylinder barrel alternately opens and shuts. Fixed to this lid is a very simple lever, operated by the movement of the lid, which sets in motion some also very simple cogwheels, and these in turn revolve fans attached to the sides and stern of the ship itself. Thus, your right reverence, in spaces where there is no resistance, contemporary ships like ours simply fall toward the nearest stability. But where there are any cosmic substances that offer resistance, it is these substances, no matter what their density, that are acted upon by the cylinder and enable the ship to move in any desired direction. It is interesting to note that the denser the substance in any given part of the universe, the better the charging and discharging of the cylinder barrel proceed, and in consequence, of course, the rate of movement of the levers is accelerated. Nevertheless, I repeat, a region without atmosphere, that is a space containing only world Ether Nokrilno is the best for contemporary ships as it was for earlier ones because it offers no resistance at all, and the law of falling can therefore be employed to the full with no need for the work of the cylinder. Furthermore, contemporary ships have the advantage that in atmosphereless spaces they can be given an impetus in any direction and can fall wherever intended without the complicated manipulations necessary in ships of the system of St. Venoma. In short, your right reverence, both in convenience and simplicity, contemporary ships are beyond comparison with the earlier ones, which were often exceedingly complicated, and at the same time had none of the possibilities of the ships we use now. Chapter 6, Perpetual Motion Wait, wait, Beelzebub interrupted. What you've just been describing must surely be that ephemeral idea that the strange three-brained beings breathing on the planet Earth called perpetual motion, for the sake of which at one time great numbers of them went quite mad or even perished. 
It once happened on that ill-fated planet that somebody got the crazy notion into his head that he could invent a mechanism that would run forever without requiring any material from the outside. This notion so took everybody's fancy that most of the crackpots of that peculiar planet began thinking about it and trying to produce this miracle. How many of them had to pay for this ephemeral idea with all the material and spiritual welfare that they had previously acquired at great cost? For one reason or another, they were all quite determined to invent what they imagined would be a simple matter. Whenever external conditions permitted, many of them gave themselves up to the search of this, for this perpetual motion without any inner data for such work, some relying upon their knowledge, others upon luck, but most of them driven by an already full-blown psychopathy. In short, to invent perpetual motion became the rage there, and every crank felt obliged to be interested in this question. I was once in a town where a large number of models and all kinds of descriptions of proposed mechanisms for this perpetual motion had been collected. What could not be found there? What ingenious and complicated machines did I not see? In any single one of these mechanisms, there were more ideas and wiseacrings than in all the laws of world creation and world existence. I noticed at the time that in these innumerable models and plans of proposed mechanisms, the idea of using what is called the force of weight predominated. The idea was this. A complicated mechanism was designed to lift a certain weight, which was then supposed to fall, and by its fall to set the whole mechanism in motion, and this motion would again lift the weight, and so on without end. The result of all this was that thousands of these unfortunates were shut up in lunatic asylums, while thousands more lost in this dream, completely neglected to fill, fulfill even those being duties that had somehow been established there in the course of many centuries, or else fulfilled them in the worst possible way. I don't know how it would all have ended if some quite demented being with one foot already in the grave, an old dotard, as they say, who had somehow acquired a certain authority, had not proved by calculations known only to himself that it was absolutely impossible to invent perpetual motion. Now, my dear Captain, after your explanation, I can understand very well how the cylinder invented by the Archangel Harriton works. It is the very thing those unfortunates dreamed of. Indeed, it can safely be said that, given atmosphere alone, this cylinder will work perpetually and without requiring any other outside materials. And since the world cannot exist without planets and hence without atmospheres, it follows that as long as the world does exist and in consequence atmospheres, the cylinder barrel invented by the great archangel Harriton will always work. Now, just one question occurs to me about the materials this cylinder barrel is made of. Could you tell me, my dear captain, what these materials are and how long they can last? To Beelzebub's question, the captain replied as follows. Although the cylinder barrel does not last forever, it can certainly last a very long time. Its principal part is made of amber with platinum hoops, and the inner surfaces of the staves are composed of anthracite, copper, ivory, and a very strong mastic, unaffected by paste chakir, tenolair, salia curiap, or even by the radiations of cosmic concentrations. But the other parts, the captain continued, both the exterior levers and the cog wheels must certainly be renewed from time to time, for though they are made of the strongest metal, long use will wear them out. And as for the body of the ship, its long existence can certainly not be guaranteed. The captain would have said more, but at that moment a sound like the vibrations of a long minor chord from a far-off orchestra of wind instruments resounded through the ship. With an apology, the captain rose, explaining as he did so that he must be needed on urgent business, since everybody knew he was with his right reverence, and no one would venture to trouble the ears of his right reverence for anything trifling. 